Hi everybody, my name is Jasmine, and today we're going to be learning about water on Earth and how we as humans interact with it. Water is everywhere around you. From the glass of water quenching your thirst, to the rain pouring over you on a stormy day, to the rivers around us, and throughout our environment. Our Earth is amazing because of the water it provides in its oceans, rivers, and even our atmosphere. It covers around 71% of the Earth's surface. Without water, no organisms are able to survive. Up to 60% of the human body is water. We need it for drinking, bathing, and so much more. A staggering 97.2% of Earth's water is found in our oceans. Just over 2% is found in our glaciers and other ice. The rest of Earth's water, which is less than 1%, is found in lakes, rivers, our soil, atmosphere, and groundwater. But what is groundwater? Groundwater is water found in beds of rock and sand below the soil on Earth's surface. Think of it as rain that lands on the ground and soaks down through the soil and into rock material. This water moves slowly and some of it eventually gets released through streams, rivers, lakes, and oceans. The groundwater moves through the soil zone or Earth's surface where both oxygen and water are found in the soil down through the capillary fringe which is above the water table. The water table is the boundary between the soil and groundwater area where only water fills the space between rocks. The topic of groundwater plays a crucial part in something called the water cycle the water cycle describes how our water is always in motion, constantly changing states from solid to liquid to gas and back. Precipitation describes the rain, hail, and snow that falls down to the earth from the clouds. This rain collects in our land, our oceans, rivers, and basically anywhere. After the rain falls down to the earth, next up is the process of evaporation. The sun's heat will cause water to turn from liquid to a gas in the form of water vapor. When this water vapor rises up from the earth, it collects around dust particles in the sky in a process called condensation. This process actually forms all the clouds above us. The three steps that we just saw, precipitation, evaporation, and condensation, basically describes how water is a cycle. So when the rain falls down to the earth, the water will evaporate and eventually condense back to form the clouds that made the rain. Beyond this small cycle, there are other parts of the water cycle, including runoff, the process by which water travels across land, down from mountains and hills. Infiltration is the process by which water moves down from the surface of the earth into the soil where it can be taken up by plants. Similar to infiltration, percolation is the process by which water flows down through the soil and deep into the rock layer of the earth. This process allows groundwater to collect in the rock layer. Plants uptake water from the soil, allowing water to move from the soil up to the surface. This water is then released through transpiration a process in which plants release water back into the atmosphere. While we commonly see water go from solid to liquid to gas, through a process called sublimation, water is able to go directly from a solid to a gas, much like ice directly to water vapor. The opposite is called deposition, in which water turns from a gas to a solid. This can happen at extremely cold temperatures when water vapor condenses to form ice. Now that we've visualized all the steps of the water cycle, it's time to put them together. Let's start off with our largest body of water, the ocean, who is joined by our cool looking sun over here. The sun provides heat, thus allowing the water to evaporate into water vapor. The water vapor condenses around dust particles to form clouds. And from these clouds, rain is allowed to fall back down to the earth in precipitation. This cycle can be repeated numerous times. If it rains on land, the water will be transported back to the ocean as runoff. If we move further inland, 
we can see our lovely little trees here taking up water from the soil through plant uptake and releasing this water back into the atmosphere through transpiration. Water released by transpiration into the atmosphere can also condense to form clouds. Now, if we move to our mountains, we can see the process of sublimation and deposition. This allows water vapor to move from vapor form to ice and back. Runoff from melting ice can also flow back down the mountain and into another body of water, like our lake here. Percolation and infiltration happens at all stages in which water travels from the water surface down into the earth and deep into the rock layer. Now that we've learned about the various stages of the water cycle, it's time to look at the two different types of water, fresh water and salt water or saline water, meaning it contains a significant amount of salt. Out of all this water on earth, a staggering 96.5% of it is salt water, leaving only 3.5% fresh water. So where is most of the fresh water on earth? Most of the fresh water is frozen in the form of glaciers and ice, while a smaller percentage of fresh water is located in groundwater and in a few rivers, lakes, and streams. So how do we use all this fresh water? The top three uses of fresh water for humans is in farming, electricity generation, and for our public supply. Farmers use a lot of water to grow our crops in a process called irrigation, or watering crops without relying on the use of rainfall. This can be done through setting up a system of pipes, digging canals, or using sprinklers to water plants. The second most common usage of water in the United States is in generating electricity, but not through dams. The equipment used to generate electricity for all of us gets really, really hot, requiring a lot of water to cool it down. The third biggest use of water is in the public supply, which provides water to your house for drinking, bathing, showering, even your toilet. It also provides water to things such as local pools, parks, even the fire department. Lastly, it also provides water to some factories for manufacturing purposes. But what about our salt water? Why can't we use that? Through a process called desalination, which is essentially removing the salt out of water, we can actually use salt water for human consumption. However, this process is really expensive. One way in which desalination occurs naturally is using the sun's heat to heat up the ocean. When the water vapor rises from the ocean, it leaves all the salt behind. By collecting this water vapor, essentially, you have taken salt water and removed the salt. You can also collect this water vapor and condense it back to form liquid water. This process can also be done on a smaller scale. If you were to heat up a pot of salt water, and collect the water vapor to condense it back into liquid, you wouldn't have to rely on the heat of the sun. The problem with desalination is that it's really hard to do on a large scale. The pot of boiling water may seem easy, but doing so to a massive amount of seawater would cost a lot of money. And seawater isn't just made out of salt and water. It can contain other chemicals and even some types of algae, plankton, and other bacteria. However, despite all the benefits our water gives us, our water is in danger. Despite our best efforts, the human population is ever growing, and with it brings a lot of problems, including pollution, wasting water, and climate change, all of which have a huge impact on our water supply. One example of a negative impact that humans have had is in the form of acid rain. When certain chemicals are introduced into our atmosphere, they can combine and condense with water into our clouds and fall back down to the earth as acid rain, a mix of chemicals and water. These chemicals can enter our atmosphere, 
from factory emissions, car and other vehicle emissions from the usage of gas, and electric power generation. A lot of the electricity and power generation today comes from the burning of fossil fuels, releasing more chemicals into our sky. When this mixture of chemicals and water falls back down to the earth, it can destroy our ocean life, as well as other plants and animals. And this acid rain does not only affect one spot. In fact, it can be transported miles and miles away through runoff and wind and hurt other ecosystems as well. Another negative impact on our water supply includes deforestation or the large scale clearing of trees and other vegetation for timber or clearing land. Trees and other plants help us by slowing runoff, stabilizing our soil, and filtering out pollutants. Slowing runoff is especially important in today's world. Runoff can not only include water, but it can also include fertilizers, waste, and other chemicals that can be deposited into our oceans or our land. Runoff in agricultural areas also include animal waste and chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides used to grow crops. Imagine if all these chemicals made it into our water supply. Our trees and plants are critical to reduce the chance that this runoff reaches lakes and other sources of Another water. negative impact humans have had on the earth is climate change. Climate change causes the temperature of the surface of our oceans to rise, which can melt our ice, hurt aquatic sea life, and raise ocean levels. This can also cause severe flooding. The biggest factor behind all these impacts is in human population growth. Over the last 50 years, our population has exploded to 7.8 billion people. It's likely that by the year 2024, 40 states will have water shortages. It's so important to conserve this water from our amazing planet. Our water supply is finite, meaning it's limited. On average, a standard shower head uses 25 gallons of water per 10 minute shower. Taking shorter showers can help you conserve water. Up to 60% of a person's water usage is in lawn and garden maintenance. So by choosing plants that require less water, you can conserve more. Also, on average, 10 gallons of water is lost each day to leaks. So by fixing your leaky faucets or shower heads, you can conserve more. The food we eat can even make a big difference on water conservation. The water used in creating a quarter pounder burger is equivalent to that of 30 American showers. To raise a cow, water is needed to grow the crops for it to eat and to give to the cow to drink. By limiting the amount of dairy and beef products you consume, you can help conserve water. A gallon of gas takes about 16 gallons of water to produce. You can conserve water by reducing the amount of times you use the car or by switching to an electric vehicle. Another way you can help save our water supply is by reducing pollution, whether it be by switching to an electric vehicle, limiting your usage of different chemicals, and stopping the dumping of waste. Yes, we need water to survive to drink, bathe in, generate electricity, grow crops, and so much more. But we're not the only ones. Our plants, animals, and environment all need this water to survive too. So it's important to remember that we're not the only ones on the planet. If we as humans can come together to save our water supply by reducing our pollution and conserving our water, then the earth can be a healthy and happier place. Thank you for listening and I will see you again next time.